Okay, we might do a quick sound check. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? We've got six people there. Yeah, I can hear you. So um, we're now in week 10, and we're going to be looking at character strings in the String Builder class. So we're up to week 10. Uh, quite interesting stuff we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to cover some new classes to do with making string more efficient. And I'll show you how inefficient it is. Okay, and uh, it might surprise you. <laughs> and we'll also look at some other useful functions like to uppercase, to lowercase, getting chars out of a string, all that sort of stuff. We've done a lot of it already. We're going to be going over that and more. Okay, so that's this week. Last week was GUI programming. We did a lot of GUI programming in a lecture and a tutorial classes. And at the end of last week, you were virtually, and so I would say you're at the stage where you could develop a summit too from scratch if you wanted to, or if you had to. Okay, so Bruce, Bruce has given you code there to, to get started with, so you use that code. But if you had to, I'm, I'm pretty sure if you, if you followed last week's classes and, and worked through them, you, you'd be at the stage where you could uh, develop a summit too from scratch. Okay, which is great. This week we're looking at uh, character strings in a string builder, like I said, so it's week 10 PowerPoints. And, um, and if you want to, we'll do more GUI development as well. So it depends on what you want to do. Um, we'll play it by year and I'll let you guide me. Okay, any questions before we start on anything? Any, anyone's got any problems or questions? We've got seven people here. Okay. So it's the uh, character strings in a string builder. We'll identify string data problems. We'll use the character class methods to look what's in a string or in a character, do conversions, stuff like that. Uh, we'll de declare, and declare and compare string objects. We'll use other string methods to uppercase, to lowercase, all sorts of things like that. And we'll look at two new classes, and there's two of them. One's called string builder, the other one's called string buffer. Okay, so there's extra classes you can use, not just string. So manipulating characters and groups of characters provides some challenges for the beginning Java programmer. No, I guess I do, in some ways. A string is a class, and each class, each string is a class object. Makes sense, each date is a date object. And a string variable name is not a simple data type, it's a reference type. So it holds a, a location in memory where the string data is stored. Okay, so, and we talked about this back, way back in week two, and a string name equals Mike. Okay, so name is a string reference field or variable. And it holds a memory address of where the data, in other words, that string is, Mike. Okay, now there are some interesting things about strings. For example, if I say name is equal to Frankie, okay, this actually creates a whole new string. Okay, so where name was originally pointing, where the data Mike lived in memory, name no longer points there, it points at a different memory location. And that's where Frankie is stored. Okay, so the original data, Mike, is still there in memory. Uh, but as far as we can tell from this code anyway, nothing is referring to it. So Java, Java's garbage click is going to go through and uh, unallocate that memory when it goes through its next sweep. And uh, so Mike will no longer exist in memory and name will just be pointing to Frankie. Okay, so that property of reference types, like strings, is that they're immutable. So if, 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 I, if, I, if I try and change a string, the actual string where, that, uh, uh, where the original string lived, that string data isn't touched. Java allocates a new location in memory where the new string data is stored and points whatever the variable name or field to that new location. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you, so if you compare two strings using the double equals operator or greater than equal to or any of those operators, so if you try and say if name is equal to Frankie or greater than equal to or less than equal to or whatever those, whatever you want to do, 
name is less than equal to Mike. Okay. So if you try and do any of those sorts of operations, you're comparing memory addresses, you're not comparing data. So these are error, comparing memory addresses, not the string data. You've got to keep that in mind as well when you're working with strings. And it's quite, it's quite hard if you're, if you're programming in lots of languages, like if you're doing some JavaScript or some Python or something like that, and you're used to comparing strings using the double equals operator and you come into, back into Java, <laughs> it's easy to make a mistake. And Java won't give you any compilation warnings. Java lets you do it, okay? But it is a logic error. So you've got to be very careful of that. So when you compare two strings using the equals or less than equal to or less than or greater than or any of those sorts of operators, you're not comparing the values, you're comparing memory locations. Uh, if you want to compare the contents of memory locations, uh, it's a lot more common to compare the contents of the strings, not the memory locations of the strings, and for that you need special methods. Okay, and uh, so that's just showing you how you can get that error. Java won't give you any compilation errors, won't give you any warnings. It'll go ahead and compile and run your code. It assumes you know what you're doing. But you're comparing memory addresses, not strings. Classes to use when working with character data. There's the character class or char. Char, char is a primitive type, but there's also a character class. And that holds an instance of a character and it defines methods that can manipulate or inspect or convert single characters. Okay, and then there's a string class as well. And it's a class of working with fixed length strings. So strings are unchanging data composed of multiple characters. So that's just referring back to what I was saying here, they're immutable. If you try and change a string, the original string or the original memory location is not changed. Java creates a new memory location and stores the new string data there. And then we come on to string build and string buffer. And you'll see why these are important later on. Okay. So character class, build on the character class. Uh, unless there's any questions so far, so we've got eight people, which is great. Any questions so far or anything? Any questions? Okay. Um, so the character class contains standard methods for testing the values of characters and manipulating characters and working with characters. Um, there's some methods like is uppercase, where you can test if a, if a char is uppercase, and that returns a boolean. And there's a method called two uppercase. It's uppercase U, uppercase C, and that returns a character that's been converted to uppercase if it needs to be converted, if it's an alphabetic character, if it can't be converted to uppercase, it just returns the original character. So it's, these are all character based. They work on one character at a time. There's other methods as well to, to, to uh, is uppercase to uppercase, is lowercase to lowercase. If you want to see what um, data contains, what, what char, char data contains, you can, do, you can use is digit, is letter. Is letter or digit, is white space. There's, and there's all sorts of other ones as well. There's a whole lot of, whole lot of methods there. We can have a quick look if you like. Find up my little help file, character. Okay, so skip past the constants and there's, you can compare characters as well using the compare functions that are built in the character class, but you can also compare them directly. Um, I'll get down to the is ones, they're the most interesting. Uh, is digit. There's a whole lot of stuff here. Is, is identifier ignorable, all that sort of stuff. There's some interesting stuff there. Is ideographic, oh my God. Stuff you'll never, you'll never very rarely or never use. Is an ISO control character. Is Java identifier start? Is Java identifier part? Okay, is Java letter? Is Java letter or digit? Is letter? Is letter? Is letter or digit? Um, 
Spice. Uh, is title case. Uh, is Unicode identifier parts. So there's a whole lot of stuff there. There's a whole lot of two, two methods as well. Um, so there's uppercase is white space. Um, and there's a whole lot of two methods. Oops, skip down past them too quickly. And you can do lots of conversions with them as well. So if you need to convert between Unicode characters or between character sets, there's almost certainly a function there in the character class to do it for you. Okay, so that's just some of the commonly used methods. A quick example to show you how to use them. So we're getting, we've got a, a, a char here, which is uppercase C inside single quotes. So chars are inside single quotes. And we're converting it. And we're saying, is it, is it uppercase? So if character dot is uppercase a char, if that returns true, then a char is uppercase, else it's not uppercase. If character dot is lowercase a char, so we're just seeing just a single character, we can say if it's lowercase or not. Um, we can convert it to lowercase. HR equals character dot to lowercase HR. Convert, it, convert back to uppercase if we want to. Is it a letter or a digit? So if character dot is letter or digit HR. And um, is it white space? And there's a whole lot of other ones as well you can do. So you can see there when we're calling those methods, we call them all with and when we want to convert HR to uppercase, we go um, Character dot two uh, case up, uppercase U uppercase C. Okay, so we're calling them all with the name of the class. Okay, so it's not Wayne and not Byron, <laughs> and uh, probably not Jared as well, and a few others. But can someone give me the answer of what sort of class or what sort of methods these are? In other words, are they static or instance methods? Anybody? Okay, so well, I'm, sure, I'm sure Wayne knows the answer. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to tell us, Wayne? <laughs> static. Yes. So, so they're all static methods. Yep. So we can just call the we can call the method for the class name, which means they've got to be static methods. Okay, so they're static. If they were instance methods. We'd have to declare a character object. We'd have to say things like um, something like that. Okay, so we, we're calling it from an object. We might also put my char in here, maybe, I don't know. We'd, who knows how it could work, okay? But if it was instance methods, if they were instance methods, okay, you'd be calling it like that, but they aren't. So they are, they're all static methods, or most of them are static methods, the vast majority. Um, they might all be, I, I can't say for sure, because I haven't looked through all of them recently. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say with absolute certainty, most of them are static methods. And that's the same with the math class. And there's other classes as well that uh, um, they probably all talk about so far. But the math class had all static methods as well. We're doing things like math.abs to get the absolute value of a number. Some class name dot. Did give away. <laughs> Righto. So, converting to checking if it's uppercase or lowercase is easy. Is upper is lower. Uh, converting it's easy. Just go to lowercase to uppercase. Checking if it's a digit or a letter. Um, is, is letter or digit, and uh, all sorts of things like that. There's heaps of other methods there. So, 
Do you want to do something with characters or do you want to see if the character contains digits or decimal places or whatever? Have a look in the, have a look in the character class. There might be a method there for it. Save you a bit of work. Any questions so far on characters? Okay, good. We'll move on. Oh, sorry, Byron, I just saw your chat. Byron also said static as well, so well done, Byron. Okay, back onto strings. So a string is just a sequence of characters enclosed within double quotes. A, ch a char or character is a single character. enclosed in single quotes. Okay. Just make it clear. And a string is zero, one or many chars enclosed Um, so literal strings, when you use literal strings, they're unnamed anonymous objects of the string class. For example, if I say um, string name is equal to Mike, that's a literal string. I'm just pulling it out of thin air, <laughs> creating a string out of it, and I'm setting name, the memory address of name to contain that memory location. Um, if I if I say um, we're doing labels last week, J label heading J label I app version one point zero. Again, that's a string literal. We're just pulling it out of thin air. We're not we're not defining that string anywhere. We could if we wanted to. We could define the string and then set the app set the heading label to the string. But we're just pulling it for this example here. We're just pulling it out of thin air. Slapping it, slapping it inside double quotes and creating a label out of it. So they're both examples of literal, literal strings. And you can't do much without them really because how are you gonna set the name if you can't pull a string out of somewhere? <laughs> okay, so it's got a, Java's gotta let you do it somewhere. So that's why it lets you do it everywhere. So a string variable is a named object of the string class, just like, just like name is. And the class string is, inside the java.lang package. So string class is part of the java.lang package. And that's automatically imported into every program when you build a Java program. So you don't have to do any imports to string or char. Uh, they're auto automatically available. Uh, so when you declare a string variable, a string itself is distinct from the variable used to refer to it. So you've got the, the, the name here contains a memory address and that memory address points to or contains the data where that piece of string data is stored. Several ways you can declare a string and initialize a string. String a greeting equals new string hello. String a greeting equals hello. So because people use strings so often in Java, Java uh, Java's allowed you this shorthand version. Okay, but if the shorthand version wasn't allowed, we'd have to do it like other objects, like we do with dates and customers and whatever. We'd have to call a string class constructor. Okay, but both of these codes do the same thing. The Java automatically inserts the new string behind the scenes there for you. Okay, that's because it's such a common operation. And um, you can create a string object without using the new keyword and without uh, explicitly calling the constructor. So that, that, that code there is fine and that's what we've been doing. But behind the scenes, that's what Java actually converts it to. So string is a class in Java. Each each created string object is a class object. Just so name is name is a class object. Um, 
So name's an object of type string, name's an instance of a string, name's an example of a string. Okay, so it's just ways of thinking about the data. And a string variable, like I've said, is a reference variable and it refers to a location in memory that holds a particular string data. If you assign a new value to a string, the address held by the string is altered. Okay, the original string, like we saw up here, I might move that down. Move it down to the string section. If I, if I change a string, Java creates a new location in memory or reserves a new location in memory where that data Frankie is stored. Mike's still there, hanging around somewhere in space at the old memory address. But eventually, maybe in a second, maybe in an hour, who knows, the garbage collector will clean up that memory and uh, release it back to the Java virtual machine. Okay, but Mike could hang around there for a few seconds or I mean, a nanosecond or <laughs> you don't know. You're not guaranteed the garbage collector could clean it up at any time. So when I say string a greeting equals hello, a greeting contains a, a number, a location in the Java virtual machine's memory, and that memory will hold the, the string data hello. And when I say a greeting equals bonjour, then a new memory location is allocated to a greeting. And the new data is stored there, the new string data. And the old data is still there. It could be there, like I said, for seconds. It could be there for hours. Nobody really knows. It's up to Java to go through and clean it up when it needs to. Okay. You'll notice as well the double quotes aren't stored. <laughs> okay, so Java knows that uh, it's string data, so it doesn't have to also store the double quotes. So it's two less characters it has to store for each string. Okay, which makes sense. So like I said, strings are immutable. Objects that cannot be changed, such as strings. Making simple char characters between strings often produces misleading results. I would change that and say making characters between strings uh, using the equals, double equals operator always produces misleading results. Um, so like we said earlier, that's comparing memory addresses. So be very careful. So if you want to compare strings, you've got the compare to method. You've got the compare to, you've got the equals method, and you've got the ignore case versions of those. There's four methods that you've got to compare strings if you need to. So the equals method evaluates the contents of the two strings character by character to see if they're equivalent. And as soon as the difference is found, it returns false. Otherwise, it keeps comparing until the length of the strings. If the string lengths are different as well, it returns false. And uh, it returns true if the strings are identical. Every character is identical in the same case. Same whatever. Okay, and then you've got the ignore case version, which doesn't worry about case. Lowercase and uppercase are the same. Do whatever it, if it equals true. Okay, or we could use equals ignore case as well if you wanted to. Okay, so we're getting some name name input from the user, and a name is equal to Carmen. We'll set a name to Carmen at the start, and we get another name from the user. Another name equals input dot next line inputs our scanner object, and if a name equals another name, we can say it's equal. Otherwise, we can say they don't equal. Pretty basic stuff. We've done this a lot of times already this term, so um, nothing nothing new here. The compare to method compares two strings and returns zero if the strings are identical. It returns a negative number if the first object is, the first string is less than the second string, and it returns a positive number if the first string is greater than the second string. Okay, so you can't necessarily guarantee what these numbers will be. You can't guarantee it's going to be negative one, for example, but you can guarantee it's going to be less than zero if the first string is less than the second string. Okay, so.
expect to what, what the result of that is. Name is less than Bella. By default, all reference types in Java are initialized to null. So if I say string name, that's going to that's actually initialized to null. So if I system.out.println that to the screen, we will see the word null appear. Okay, it's not the string null; it's a memory address null. Okay, which is a special memory address in Java, where Java automatically initializes all reference variables to that to that location. But you can't read. You can't read from it. You can't write to it. You can't call methods from it. Okay. So if I try and do this, that'd be an error because I'm trying to call a compare to method for the null memory address, which you cannot do. You cannot do it. Java is so protective of that address. You can't do anything with it. You can't. Uh, you can't read it. You can't call methods for it. <laughs> okay. So you've got to be very careful. So not a bad thing to do when you're creating strings is just initialize them. And then, then they're safe to use. Okay. Uh, or else if you don't want to do that, you would have to do this. If name is not equal to null, and I put brackets around a whole lot, that would be okay. We're only going on to this part of the if statement, if name is not equal to null. So that would be an error, but that, that there would be perfectly okay. Because okay, we're only going to that second part if name is not equal to null. I wish you can just initialize your strings, make sure you have initialized them somewhere to something, and then you can compare them however you like, and that would be okay. Okay, so it saves you doing this sort of stuff through your code. Either way is fine. That's not bad code. In fact, that's good code. That's 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 very good code, because you because you're protecting against the null memory memory address. So that's perfectly fine. Uh, this is a little bit short if you want to go that way. If you want to initialize it and go the short way, that's fine as well. We've got nine people. That's good. We've increased by one. <laughs> nine people. So strings like other reference variables are set to null by default. So same with dates, customers, employees, they're all set to null by default, unless you say equals new or you allocate a, a string in this case like that. And, uh, and of course, null cannot be used to call methods. So if you try and call a, a string method with a null memory address, no, 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 not allowed. There's two uppercase and lowercase. There's a length method, method. We've been using using these methods a lot during the term. Uppercase, lowercase, and length, especially length. Just remember, it's to, it's got an uppercase U and an uppercase C. If you come from a, a C++ background, you're used to typing uppercase U and lowercase C, which is um, it's a hard habit to break once you've been done a lot of C++ code. There's also the index off method to find if a, if, a, if a string contains a character or another string. So you could say if, in, if name dot index and it's uppercase O off. Okay. If that's greater than or equal to zero, then it does contain it. And whatever that index of returns will be the, the index of the start of that data. Okay, so strings are like arrays, they start at zero. So if name was Mike, we wanted to get name index of Mike. What would, what would index contain?
Wine. Yep, that's right, Wayne. Yep, thank you, Wayne. I knew it was going to be Wayne or Byron or, or Jared that answered it, or Sanjin. <laughs> so we turn to value one, okay? So zero is the first character, I is the second character, K is the third character, E is the fourth character, but it's zero, one, two, three. They're the index locations. So I, the I case starts at index location zero, one. So it's going to return one. What would, uh, what would this return? We haven't done it yet, so it's hard to know, but it would return a negative number. It's something less than zero, okay? And again, it's best to not test if it's negative one or negative two, just test if it's net less than zero. Okay, if it's less than zero, this string here wasn't found inside Mike or whatever the, whatever the value is that's been called for, name, whatever. Okay, um, so it returns the first position of the character. The first position of the string is zero, like, like arrays. If the return value is negative one or negative value, don't, 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 don't rely on negative one. Just go less than zero. If it's less than zero, it doesn't exist. Okay, be very careful of relying on particular values in a negative range. The char at method we've used, we've used that through some of the two questions as well. And that returns a character at a certain location. So system.out.println name.char at three, three. Would it return the character at index location three? So zero, one, two, three. So it return the E. Make sure you start your counting at zero. <laughs> it's very easy to make mistakes. Um, you can also use ends with and starts with. Okay, so, um, and each one of those takes a string argument and returns true or false if the string starts with something or ends with something. So if the string was string, itty is equal to Hampton, you could say if, city dots dot starts with RO. If that's true, then you can do whatever processing you want to do for RO cities. Okay, same with ends with. Um, I'm, I'm, there's also other methods as well. Let's have a quick look. Starts starts with that's, starts with that's better. So have a look at the string class. There's heaps of other methods there. String. So this is starts with, starts with, um, and the ends with's up here. Ends with. There it is. Ends with. So you can click on those and see more information if you need to as well. There's more help there. Um, they're case sensitive. So if I put if I put RO there, lowercase RO, that would be false. That one there would be true. So there's no, there's no, there's no uh, ignore, ignore case option there. So if you want to compare what, does, what a city starts with and forget about case, you could do this. So city dot to uppercase. Dot starts with and then go RO uppercase or whatever. We could even go lowercase RO to uppercase. And that would return true then. So just be careful of doing this sort of stuff, particularly in loops. And we'll have a look at the reason why shortly. 
But um, if, if you can just calculate that value once, store city uppercase somewhere rather than calculate it multiple times or derive it multiple times. Okay, so string functions tend to be pretty expensive in terms of system resources. Although if you're not calling them thousands of times a second, there's um, in a loop or something there, there's no, no real danger, I guess. So will that change city or will it only do that if you use an equals operator? Uh, yeah, so we, we're just we, we're getting the current value of city, converting it to uppercase on the fly. So now we've got a, a, a temporary string in memory that's converted to uppercase. And we're seeing, seeing if it starts with, again, we've got, a, we've got a temporary string in memory, RO. We're converting it to uppercase. So now there's uppercase RO as well in memory. So we're creating strings everywhere. Right? Uppercase version of this, lowercase RO, uppercase RO, and we're comparing the uppercase versions. So yeah, it's actually doing quite a lot of string creation, this, this little bit of code. So that's why you've got to be careful with string operations. They are quite slow in terms of, uh, compared to integer operations or, or, or double floating point operations or whatever. Um, so, if, so if you're doing this in a loop a million times, there's more efficient ways to do it. You would do that once outside of the loop. You would do that once or as few times as possible, and then just compare them, compare the uppercase versions. Okay. Um, there's a replace method to replace um, parts of parts of a character. So cities Rockhampton. We could say city equals city dot replace. Yeah, when with Vale. So now it'd be Rockhampton, Rockhamp, Vale. <laughs> okay, so you can do that sort of stuff. Just replace whatever with whatever. It can be single characters, it can be multiple characters. You can you can you can pull data out as well. So um, So here we end up with Hamp Vale, and here we end up with Rock Hamp. So again, we're, we're, we're doing string operations on a string. So the old string would still be there in memory somewhere until the garbage collector cleans it up. But um, the new string would be a new memory location we set up just to contain that bit of data there. And concatenation we've been looking at since the start of term, you can just use a plus sign to concatenate strings. Um, nice and easy. And you can, you can concatenate strings onto integers, onto floats, onto doubles, onto booleans, onto dates, onto customers, onto um, products, onto whatever you like, onto employees. So you can concatenate them all together. And if there's a two-string method, if, you do, if you're doing it for one of your class objects or a class object, Java looks for the two-string method and automatically calls that if it's not being called directly. Okay, so it tries to get a string representation of your data. If, it, if there's no two-string method in your class, then it gives you that funny stuff thing, we, funny thing we looked at earlier. Employee imp equals new employee. We looked at what happened when the employee class didn't have a two string method and we went system.out.println. And remember what we saw on screen when we did that? It was the memory address, wasn't it? That's right, that's exactly right. We'd see the class name, which is employee, followed by an ampersand, followed by some strange number, whatever, <laughs> some, some random number. And that's the memory address in the Java virtual machine where this employee starts or where this employee resides, where the data starts for that employee. Okay. But if there is a two string, if employee class does not have a two string method, 
employee class does have a two-string method, we would see, who knows what, name, blank, ID, blank, you know, whatever, whatever the data is anyway, we'd see something that made a lot more sense than just random numbers. The same applies to concatenation. If you if you, if I concatenated that employee onto that string, um, then what gets concatenated on here depends on whether there's a two-string method or not. Java automatically will invoke it if there is one. Also, substring methods, that's to pull out parts of a string. So you provide two integers inside brackets. There's a start position and there's also an end position. So some of these substring methods work by saying the start position and the number of characters. Java doesn't. Java substring works by saying the start position and the end position. Okay, so keep that in mind if you're used to other substring type systems in other, other programming languages. So if we had City Rockhampton, and I went system.out.println city.substring 3,5. Anybody but Wayne or Byron? <laughs> what would we see on screen if I did that? City.substring 3 to 5. Okay, so it's a start position and the end position. What would we see on screen? So the, the first thing I'm doing in my head anyway is I'm doing this sort of thing. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. KHA? Yes, I, I like that answer, KHA. Thanks, Byron. KHA. So you've got to be careful to start at zero. That's the other trick. And is it up to and including the digit five, character five, location five? And according to this, it is. Um, and if you, if you try and do something silly like this, it'll still just give you still just give you the what's left of the string, Campton. Okay, so, um, which is good, <laughs> because otherwise you could, if, 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 it didn't, if it didn't have that protection built in, who knows what data you could be getting. Who knows what you could be pulling into your, into your uh, output or your string data. Okay, you could, could be getting all sorts of stuff, bits of dates and bits of who knows what, but it just ends there, just goes to the end of the string. Okay, so if the, if the length of the extracted substring is the difference between the second and the first integer. Exactly right. Um, so Byron, Byron's saying here, is it KH or KHA? So, very good point. Let's do it, then we can find out for sure. So it's KH. Okay, so the slide doesn't make that really clear, but the start position is where it starts and the end position is the end. So it's up, and up to that end position, not up to and including that end position. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we see the CH, sorry, KH. So keep that in mind if you. Know. 
Here we're prompting for some user input. Uh, while got an integer called x, x equals zero, while x is less than name dot length. So we're going through the character, we're going through the, the name, a character at a time. If name dot char at x is equal to a single space inside quotes, then we've got the first name. First name equals name dot substring zero to x. So x is, x is the location of the space. So we're going up to that location before the space starts. And then the family name, in other words, what's rest of the name would be um, name substring x plus one. So we're jumping over the space, x plus one's jumping over the space to the length of the string. And then going plus plus x. Okay, so this little bit of code here will work fine if they enter something like this. Okay, but if they enter something like this, okay, so you would think. That was my first name and that was my family name. And then the next time through the loop, it would pull out, maybe maybe, maybe that's my first name and that's my family name. Who knows what it's gonna do after that? It's, it's gonna get it wrong anyway, but that would work fine if it was just two words typed in. Okay, so if, if they just enter two words, it says just enter the first name and last name, so it does say enter just two words, so that should work fine. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So Boris just made a good point there about this about this string builder. So it's uh, substring. So it's up to up. To, but excluding end index. Just keep that in mind if you're working with substrings. It's easy to make a mistake. When, when you're writing a code, you can just print out the data to the screen and see what you're getting anyway, and you'll realize pretty quick it's there's so many things you've got to keep in your mind, it's impossible to keep them all. So just write little bits of code like little snippets, give it a test, and you'll find out what's what pretty quick. Um, okay, so region matches um, is, let's have a look at the Java help on that because that's a little bit vague there. Region matches are to test if, so you, you're actually testing two regions of a string. So you're testing whether you want to, you want to say whether you want to, well, there's one, there's multiple versions. The basic one is you've got a, a string and, you, and you're saying which, where you want to start comparing that string and where you want to start comparing string other offset. Okay, yep. Let's just have to look at your call there. So if city dot region. So we're going to start from the Start from position eight. So eight in that string, if that's equal to okay, so you're saying what the start index is of the first string. And we're starting at location eight, which is a T. And then we've got the second string there that we want to compare to, and we want to start at like location one in that string. So we're starting at the T again. And then we want to say how many characters we're comparing. Yeah, the length, the number of characters we're comparing. So we're going to compare three characters. Okay, and that would return true. So we're comparing Ton with Ton, and uh, with the match.
Okay, so region matches. You're matching part of one string. See, you're checking if part of one string matches part of another string. Okay. The substring of the specified string object is compared to the substring of the other. If the substrings contain the same character sequence, then the expression is true, otherwise it's false. And the second version uses an additional Boolean argument determines whether the case is ignored or not when comparing strings. So that's the, the ignore case version up here. So if you pass through a true or a false as a first value, pass to the method, then uh, it'll determine whether you compare case sensitive or not. So we talked about this sort of stuff here earlier with starts with and ends with. And I talked about how if you want to do case, case insensitive, you could do that. But uh, maybe you could use region matches as well. It'd be a little bit more complicated code because you want to say how many characters you want to start with. But uh, that, would, that would probably be faster because you're uh, not converting to uppercase and creating extra strings in memory. Okay, so maybe instead of doing that, you could adapt this slightly or do the case sensitive version, case insensitive. So if I do false there, then it's not case sensitive. So I could compare to a ton and that would still be true. Ignore case. So false is ignore case. Any questions on a string class? Any questions there on that? We've got nine people, still got nine people here. We're almost an hour in. Any questions? So there's plenty of other stuff there in a string class. There's a whole heap of methods. Um, trim for removing white space in the start and end, so tabs or space at the start or end of a, tree, a string. We've used that a lot. Um, if you need to do uh, yeah, value off, so you get a value off Boolean, but you don't need to do that. You can just say plus Boolean and we'll do true or false. Um, so. so there's the substring method. There's also a subsequence method, which works a little bit differently. So check out that if you want. Um, there's a split command. Split's a brilliant command, split. Goodness me. Okay, so let's say I've got Mike. Frankie, Bella, Sam, okay, let's say I've got that data there and I want to split it up into each individual individual name. Don't write the code to do it, don't go looking for commas and pull out the data, <laughs> just, just do split. I'll call, I'll call that first one name string, just make it a little bit clearer. This one's going to be an array of names. String names is equal to name string dot split comma. How do you like that? <laughs> so now we've got all those names put into an array. Mike's location zero, Frankie's location one, Bella's location two, Sam's location three. Okay, so put into an array of names really quick. So if you're, if you're loading data into your program and it's CSV data or tabs, it's tab separated. Just say slash T there. Okay, and that'll do the same thing. So if you're bringing data from file, comma separated, tab separated, space separated, whatever, whatever you want to do, you can use name split. You do have to be a little bit careful because um, this what, what it takes in here is a regex. Then you've got to be careful. Because you might be typing a string of characters in there that you might think of as a string and Java might try and interpret as a regex and you'll be getting bizarre results. <laughs> okay, so.
So you can get some truly bizarre results if you're not careful. Okay, onto the integer class, integers. So they're part of the Java lang class as well, java.lang.integer, like the character class was in a string class. And they're automatically available in programs. And the most popular method we've been using so far is the good old int integer uh, age, integer chorus int. I've been doing the integer dot passing a lot. Scroll up and get a okay, so we're doing that a lot. So that's that's part of the integer class. So we say integer dot passing because the passing method lives in the integer class and we're passing through a string to convert. So what sort of method is passing? Is it instance or static and not, not Byron and not uh, Wayne? So is that an instance or a static method? Nine people? Anyway, Wayne, Wayne and Byron are screaming at the screen already. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a static method, so. Again, most of the methods in the, in the instance class are static methods. You can have a look if you like. Yeah, let's have a look, it's fun. Pugrain and the Java help. Okay, so there's all sorts of stuff you can do. Bit counts and byte values, compare, compare. You can use that to compare integers. Compare to. Uh, you can do decodes and uh, compare run signs and all sorts of stuff, equals. Hash codes, haven't we really talked about hash codes yet? Ah, yes. That's a good, that's a good question, Wayne. So Wayne's just asked the question. Why isn't there, is, why isn't there a method like is int to, uh, to test if a string is an integer before you try, try and pass it? Um, you can do that a little bit by going through the characters of the string. You could, you could develop your own and go through the characters in the string and say, is that a digit? Is that a digit? Is that a digit? Um, you don't have to write that method once. And um, um, then you have to do one for floats as well, because floats could contain a, a full stop in decimal places. And you have to make you have to go through and make sure that there wasn't two decimal places or three decimal places. So yeah, we could, we could develop these methods. So they could be built into Java, but they're not. We could develop our own methods, but there's better ways to do it. And that's where ex exception handling comes in. Okay, so so don't don't don't, don't start writing methods like is int because uh, in the following course we do it exception handling, and that just negates the need for it. Okay, to give you a little bit of taste of what exception handling is. Okay, that would that would that would destroy our program until now. It would crash our program, but if you go try. Open curly, close curly, catch, exception. What we do is we put that inside there. That's what, uh, yeah, that's what, that's right, Byron. So, um, it just comes down to using exception handling. So there's a, a, a couple of commands in exception handling. Try and catch it two of them. And um, so you, inside the try block, you put any code that might raise exceptions. For example, that you could put, you could have a whole lot of stuff, a lot of code in there if you wanted to. And if that, if any of that code in there raises an exception, this code down here in the catch runs. So you can set h to zero. You could um, system dot out dot print line error age was not valid. Integer. You can do whatever you like. Okay. So it's not hard. Exception handling is not hard. 
uh, it's a deep subject to, to do the to, to do the basics like that's really easy, but it's a very another one of these iceberg topics where we just look at the tip, <laughs> and it's actually got a lot of depth to it. And um, okay, so we're just going to uh, just Byron's asked a few questions here, so I'll just put Byron's questions up. So isn't there a then block as well as the plays regardless? Yes. So I don't want to show too much here. We're not covering exception handling, but there is there's a there's another block here that you can put there that runs regardless of what happens and, and cleans up regardless. So there's all sorts of things you can do. Okay, but uh, we don't cover it in this course. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there's a whole there's a whole lot of methods you might like to be in the integer class and and a double class and that sort of thing. But when you come onto exception handling, it just negates the need for them. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so Byron's just saying he knows a bit of this from from Python. It is it's, when when you learn a new language and you and you're limited, it's hard to forget what you already know, already know. Yeah, so it is hard. And, um, okay, so wrapper classes, another topic. Also called auto boxing. Hmm. What can I say about wrapper classes? Okay, so int and double and char, they're all the primitive types. Okay. There's also reference types versions of those. Integer, double, character, and so on. Boolean and so on. Okay. And um, so when I when I declare an integer, I can say int k1 is equal to five, and that's fine. That's just a primitive value. Or I can say integer k2 is equal to five, and that's a reference type. Okay. So k2 contains a memory address of where the data five is stored. Here, K1's just a placeholder for the value five. Okay, the, the value is contained right there in the memory location where, where, K, where K points. But here we're going to do a jump to where the memory address of the value of K is. <laughs> so we're going to do the double hop. Okay, so that's why when we say, that's why it's integer.parsint, it's not. It's not int. So that's why it's integer dot pass int. There's this whole other class here that mirrors the primitive types, one for each one. So there's uh, float and long and short and byte and all, 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 all the primitive types are all included. Okay, so there's a reference type for each one. So why? Why does Java do all that extra complexity? Why, why, why? <laughs> There's actually very good reasons for it. Let me just say for now, I'll give you just one simple example. So when you create an array list, you can only create array lists of primitive types. Oh, sorry, of reference types. Okay, so that's, a, that's fine. That's fine. You could even create an array list, an array list of employee arrays. If an employee array was a, a class in, that you'd built. Okay, they're, they're all fine. But if you try and if you try and do this, that would be a, a primitive type. Okay, so you've got this beautiful array list class, but it can only work with reference types. So if you want to store integers in an array list, use the wrapper class. And that's okay. So, bit of a lame excuse, I guess, really, because why don't you just create a special version of a list that works with integers? Okay, so it probably is a bit of a lame excuse, but I'm just showing you one reason for it that I can show you now. We can't talk about, these are all iceberg topics. <laughs> I don't want to talk about what's down here yet because we're still up in the top. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so if you see if you see someone talking about wrapper classes, that's all they're talking about. They're talking about the uppercase versions, the reference type versions of the primitive types. 
okay? And if you see the term auto boxing getting used, that's when this happens. So that's an int and that's an integer and Java automatically takes care of the conversion. Okay, similarly I could say K1 is equal to K2. Java takes care of the conversion. Converting from a primitive type to a reference type. And here, and that's okay. Java takes care of the conversion. And that's what auto boxing is. It's not punching. <laughs> it's just automatically converting the data for you. Java taking care of things for you. So you don't have to worry about all the minute details of everything that's going on. Okay, so that's all I'll say on wrapper class and auto boxing. I wouldn't have mentioned it, but it was there. Okay, so wrapper class, I think of them, think, think about them this way. They're a class or an object that wraps around a simpler element. So integer wraps around int and provides a whole lot of extra functionality. Double wraps around double and provides a whole lot of extra functionality and so on. Okay, so. And of course, there's other ways to do it. Not all languages do this sort of stuff. And of course, there's other ways you could have done it. It's just, that's the decision that Java devs made back in the early days and they've stuck with it. So, history. Okay, 11.07. Any other questions on what we've done so far? Wrapper classes? Things I didn't want to talk about, but talked about. <laughs> No questions? Okay, we're still at nine people here. We're 11.07, so we've got uh, in the final, final hour. Okay. So there's a whole, whole lot of methods in there that are really useful. So if, you, if you're thinking of doing something, oh, I need to do this with integers, have a look in the wrapper class. I need to do this with doubles, have a look in the wrapper class. Okay, so there's pass in and pass double, but there's a whole lot of other stuff as well. Okay, so have a poke around. And if, if you're keeping a summary of snippets of useful code, add, add anything you find it's useful, add it into your summary or your snippets. Okay, it'll save you hunting for it later. So there's a value off method that converts a, a string to an integer, value off. Okay, so instead of integer.passing, you can do value off if you want to. Let's do that. Boop, boop, boop. Let's have a look at the, the help on that and see why we, you'd want to do that. Value of, value of string. Returns an image object holding the value of the specified string. The argument is interpreted as representing a signed decimal integer exactly as if the argument were given to a pass int. Okay, so it's just another a way of doing a pass int. Okay. So why they got pass int and value of, again, it probably comes down to history. Maybe when the devs were developing Java, they someone had done value of, and people were using it out in industry, and someone else had written pass int, and now people were using it out in industry, and rather than try and delete one of the methods, they just kept them both there, and one calls the other probably behind the scenes. Um, so it's, it's equivalent to that. So I, I would say value offer calls integer.passing behind the scenes. I haven't looked at the code, but I'm, I'd be pretty, pretty surprised if it didn't. They, they certainly wouldn't have implemented the same code twice. Pass double, so the one in a double class takes a string, converts it to a double. Um, like I said earlier, the string class is fixed. The objects are immutable, they cannot be changed. If you do try and change a string, a new allocation in memory is made and the new string data is stored in that location. Okay. So because of that reason, if you're doing lots of string operations, it can be really slow. Okay. 
And I'll show you that in a second. I'll show you how slow things can be when you're dealing with strings. So if you've got a string that's adding data onto a string, adding data onto a string, and you're doing it in a loop or in a nested loop, <laughs> things slow down very quick. Because all, all, all these times new strings are being allocated and data's copied across and then the new data's added on and a whole lot of extra stuff's going on. So like string, string builder and string buffer are automatically included in every Java program you write. We've just never used them yet. Okay, they're automatically there. They're part of the Java Lang package, which is automatically included in every Java program. Okay, so string builder is more efficient. Okay, so string builder. There's also a string buffer, which works in exactly, it's exactly the same commands to work with string buffer, but it's thread safe. So if, you, if you've got code that's um, updating, a, updating a single string buffer object in multiple threads, or, uh, or reading one, one, one thread's updating the buffer, the string buffer object, another string's reading it to see what's in it, um, then you want to use string buffer because it's thread safe. Okay, so it's got the collision detection and and all that sort of stuff built in, or collision handling anyway. Okay. Unfortunately, in our Java courses, we don't do any multi-threaded stuff. There used to be a, a Java course where we did advanced Java. Uh, we did multi-threaded programs and a whole lot of really good stuff, and that got chopped because there wasn't enough students to keep it going. So sadly, we don't do string buffer anymore. We just do string builder. We only do a little bit of that. So sad. To create a string builder object, you go string builder. It's really hard. String builder, SB equals new string builder. And you've got to spell it right, of course, string builder. Okay, so that's how you create one. If you want to initialize it with data straight away, you can do that as well. If you want to put some data in there. that's fine and so when you want to add data into a string builder object you go sb.append like we did with our text areas last week we're doing text area.append you do the same sort of thing with string builders dot append you can also append model with bits of data at a time We can get today's date in there as well, plus um, 55, plus I'm just typing in random data. <laughs> okay, so you can do all that sort of stuff as well if you want, that's fine. But that, that all gets converted into a string and it's all in, appended onto the string buffer object or string builder object. Okay, if you want new lines, you've got to put new lines in, just like we do with text areas. So if you want a new line between items, plus slash n, or if you want a new line at the start of an item, you can put the slash n at the start. So it just depends on where you want new lines. So the append method. Um, so this constructed with the keyword new, so it's just like creating any, any other object, employee m equals new employee, same sort of thing. And um, now each string builder has got a buffer, which is the amount of memory that it's currently using, currently got reserved. And there's a capacity, which is the actual length of the buffer. So the string that's in the data, the string, string data that's in the buffer so far might not occupy the entire buffer. So you can have a length of a buffer and you've also got the capacity of a buffer. A buffer. If you want to change the length of a buffer, if you want to pre-allocate, you can go set length. And that changes the length of a string in the string builder object. You can also get the user length property. It's a length property, so it's not a length method. And that's an attribute of the string builder class that identifies the number of characters in the string in the string contained in the string builder. So the length property gives you the length of the string data. System dot out dot print line sp dot length. So when we talk about length of strings before, we've used the length method. But now when you talk about string builders, you've got to go back to the string property. So it's more like an array than a, than a normal string because we're using a property, not a length method. And if you want to say used, you could say sp dot capacity. So 
this would this would print out a little uh, summary of how much how much of your string builder you've actually used so far. So um, you might have twenty characters used, jars used, and you might have fifty characters available or fifty whatever whatever the capacity of the string builder is. Okay. So here we're, here we're creating a string builder, initializing it with Barbara, um, getting the capacity of the string builder, printing it to the screen. Okay, so name string dot capacity. Uh, string builder address string equals null, address string equals new, string builder 631, Hickory Grove, whatever. Um, and then we get a, the capacity of that. Let's do some of this. Let's have some fun. And we'll do a system out print line. We'll just run that code there. Oh, I, missed, uh, I missed a plus. I saw that as I was compiling. SB dot length. Length property. Okay, just a sec, we might have to look at this a different way. Hmm. I'll leave off the length for now and we'll just look at the capacity. So 42 chars are available in the string builder object, 42 chars, but our input's only 26. Okay, so string builder automatically allocates more than it needs. And when we use up all the space, if we keep going append, let's do that, so sp.append. Data. Make it resize. Then we'll have a look at the capacity and see what it says. Okay. You'll see 42 and it's gone to 350. Okay. So we're not storing 350 characters in there. It's just that's how much space is allocated. Okay, so these things auto grade like like uh, like array lists auto grow when you add items to them. Every time you append data to an array list or to a string builder, if it needs to grow, it will, and it allocates extra space. Um, so this one here was storing what twenty five characters, if that, in there. So it might have a capacity of fifty. Here we're storing seven characters or so. So it might have a capacity of twenty to start off with. Who knows? Um, you can use set length to do stuff as well. Like if we do sb dot set length to ten, let's see what happens. And we'll also do a we'll just also do an sb dot to string. Okay, so we'll display what the capacity is now, and we'll to string it as well. Okay, so the, we've, we've done a set length to 10. Uh, the capacity is still 350. That is, the set length doesn't change the capacity, but we've truncated our data to, to 10 characters. So one, two, three, four, Smith. Okay, so set length doesn't change the capacity of the string builder or string buffer but it does change the amount of data that's in there, it can truncate it. So you've got to be careful of set length. Let's have a quick look at String Builder. So 
So a pen's the main method you'll use. And um, there's the capacity method. You can also insert strings at certain locations. So you don't, have to, you don't have to append to the end. You can insert at a certain location in the string buffer or string builder. Um, and you can insert characters, arrays of characters, and char sequences, and strings, and all sorts of things. You can insert long floats, you can do inserts as well. So plenty of stuff there. There's the length method. So it is a length method, it's not a length property. It's a length property internally, but to get access to it, we need to uh, to call up to, to, to call the method. So what the slide said wasn't quite seemed to be a little bit misleading. Uh, used. Okay, so after we store that first bit of data in there. That's 26 bytes long, and we do an SB length, and it's telling us 26 used out of 42 available. So that's what Java automatically allocated, 42. I don't know why it chose 42. <laughs> it just chooses a number. And then we added a whole bunch more stuff, and we've used 258 characters out of 350. So again, it's keeping space that we haven't used yet available, so we can add more strings in straight away without having to resize anything. Then after the set length, we're, uh, we're truncating the data and we've got 10 used and 350 available. 10 used, 350 available. So set, set length warning is truncates your data. Okay, so length, length method and capacity method. A bit strange to not get capacity and get length. That would be a normal thing for a accessor methods, but length and capacity, I guess, are fine. So pretty hard to work, pretty easy to work with. So you got, let's just grab that code from there. And insert length, capacity. You probably won't even use capacity that often. They're the three methods you're going to use a lot. Okay. Maybe capacity if you want to just have, keep an eye on it just for fun. So the string builder improves over string in terms of performance. If you're doing a lot of string operations and you're adding, concatenating strings onto strings and data onto strings, string builder is a lot faster. And, um, there's various flavors of the constructor. So there's one where you can provide the initial capacity. There's also one, where we've looked at the one where you can provide a string or the, or the default one, but you can also set up a capacity as well. So if you know you're gonna read 100,000 lines of data from a file, you can do the capacity up front. So you can do this sort of thing. So I'm gonna read 100,000 lines of data from a file and each line approximately is 60 characters on average then you can pre-allocate your string builder. Okay, and that saves it doing all the resizing stuff it has to do behind the scenes when you add more data into it. Okay, so that's pre-allocating. A lot of data. So that's how you pre-allocate. Um, and insert set char, you can set char out as well as insert set char out if you need to. Uh, all sorts of other ones as well. Just have a look in the help. There's a whole lot of stuff there. Trim to size, all sorts of things. Hours of hours of fun <laughs> for a rainy afternoon. <laughs> char out method to get the char out as well. Like string, you can do a char out for a string. Zero is the first index or first char character. One's a second in character and so on. Okay, so you can pull out the characters of character by character if you need to. Bit of a benchmark, I'll put that code here. Oh, 
we can run it. So what this code does, I've got a string and I've got a string builder one and a string builder two. And I'm gonna do a loop just concatenating Java onto the string over and over and over again. Okay, so the string builder, I'm, I'm just doing the default. Well, we just do that. The default constructor. And I'm also, uh, I know I'm gonna do 50,000 iterations. So that's a loop iterations I'm gonna do. And I know the length of data I'm adding on each times four characters or the length of that. So I've pre-allocated the buffer with the number of iterations times the length of that string. String to appends that string. Okay, and get the length of that. So 50,000 times four, so 200,000 characters. So I've preset the, the string builder. And uh, let's use that down here. Append, string to append. And there's that benchmarking code we looked at earlier where we're using the local date and time dot now dot get nano to get the start time and the end time. And, um, and I've got the loop there for x equals zero, x is less than loop iterations, x plus plus, or plus plus x, doesn't matter. So that's our loop iterations. Uh, and then I'm getting the, the, the milliseconds that have elapsed. End time minus start time divided by nanoseconds per millisecond, which is my constant up here. So I'm doing that for string builder one, which is our default one. Then I'm doing it again for string builder two, which is our pre-allocated one. And then I'm doing it for string, just normal string. Okay, so let's up the iterations. We're gonna do a million iterations. Let's see how fast it is. How much difference do you think there is gonna be? Let's place some bets. So do you think, do you think string builder will be, what, three seconds faster? Ten seconds faster? Fifteen seconds faster? So we're doing a million iterations, concatenating one string onto another, or more than fifty seconds faster. So we've got A, B, C's and D's there. Everyone have a vote, A, B, C, D, just for fun. It's just fun, no one's, if you can guess the right answer. So we're doing a million iterations of concatenating a string onto an existing string. How much faster will string builder be? Just have a guess in the window, just type the chat in. Wayne said C, 15 seconds, that's a, that's a fair guess. B for Byron, 10 seconds faster. Any other guesses from the other seven people that are here? Any more guesses? Oh, Tamiki, yep, B. Andrew's got a B, good, good. Okay, I'm glad everyone's joining in. It's great to see you, thanks for coming. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so we've got most of our guesses ranging in that sort of area, 10 to 15 seconds faster for a million iterations. I'm, I'm running this on a Core i7 laptop. It's eighth gen, so it's pretty fast. It's got um, eight, eight, giga, eight giga memory and it's got Windows, 60, Windows 10 64 bit and Java 64 bit installed, so. Uh, this should be running as fast as it can with Java. So let's see what it's like for... Okay, so you can see the, the string builder came back straight away, the default one. The one with pre-allocated came back um, even faster. And let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I should have got the stopwatch out. I should just put a stopwatch up here. <laughs> it's going to display the number of milliseconds anyway. But it actually takes a long time. And this is running on a Core i7. Okay. Eighth, eighth gen Core i7. It's a laptop, but it's a fast laptop. And um, so as you can see, Strings are slow. Strings are slow, slow, slow. It's still going. Okay. I might leave that run in the background and I'll just take the little window out of it so we can see it, if it when it finishes. I'll just poke it over there and we'll continue on. And uh, someone, if someone wants to time it, they can always time it from the video. But you can see we're, we're a lot longer than 30 seconds now. Uh, we've got to be up over a minute now. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe we'll find out by the end of the tutorial. That's what Wayne said. Maybe we'll find out by the end of the term. <laughs> Is that still running? We'll just move on. So that's basically this example here. Uh, I've modified things slightly. Okay. Um, okay. Now I'm, I find that this um, uh, get nano. I, I find it produces really strange results if you call it too close together, and I find it gets strange results from sometimes anyway. Um, like when this returns here, I probably see something crazy like um, so many milliseconds, which indicates truncations happened. Okay, so. Um, Get nano might be good for uh, timing things that are close together, but when it's 30 seconds or more, it tends to give strange results as well. But anyway, we'll see what happens. So that's basically it for our, our code for this week. 11.30, that's probably enough for a class. Um, so once again, so write lots of code, get lots of practice, and um, I'll move my, <laughs> I'll move this over this one, keep an eye on it still. So it still hasn't come back, it's still going. <laughs> so we did quite a lot today. Uh, we looked talked about um, string builder, string buffer. We had a, a deep dive, uh, well, uh, a deeper look at um, the integer and double classes and talked a little bit about wrapper classes and auto boxing. Um, so what are we doing this week's due? The summer due, the summer two is due at the end of next week. Okay, so you've still got plenty of time there. But uh, what we might do is do a couple of string builder and string buffer examples in the, in the tube. And then we might move on to, if you want to, if you want to move on to some more GUI stuff. Okay, so we might even look at slapping a GUI on a dogs and dogs, dogs and dog and dog tester classes. Or else continue on with our lecture example that we were, we were doing. Okay, so we'll see what we want to do. See what you want to do on Friday. Okay. It's still going. That's got to be a few minutes now. Still nine people here. There's still, still nine people watching it. <laughs> so the moral of the story over here is if, you, if, if you're doing a lot of string stuff, Especially if it's in a loop. Use string builder. Or if you're doing multi-threaded stuff, use string buffer, but um, string builder. It, 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 could, it could save minutes of your runtime of your program. I, I was did some work for one of the apps I wrote for a client recently was, well, a couple of years ago. Um, it was doing a lot of processing and adding results into a text area. And I changed over from building up with a string to building up with a string builder. And at the end I went to text area, dot set text, my string builder object dot to string. And so at the end I did that instead of building it up in a string and then setting, set texting it to a string. And it, it, it cut the execution time for when I click the button down from like 30 seconds down to less than a second. Is that one change? And you can, you can really see that's the case here. Might not. To be honest, I don't know how long this is gonna take. I haven't run this on this laptop. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, could be, it could be the Friday's shoot, I don't know. <laughs> Wayne said here, is it, too, is it too late to change his bet? <laughs> no. We can change it. So we know that's the right answer now. In fact, if there's an answer there, an answer E saying more than five minutes, I think we'd probably all, I think what we're seeing now, we'd all be going with that one. <laughs> now that's it for today. So get lots of practice, do lots of coding, um, have a play around with String Builder. Once you start using it and you, you get comfortable with it using appends and inserts and whatever, You'll probably find you use it for just about everything instead of string, because string really is a lousy class when you get down to it, especially if you're doing concatenations in a loop. Okay. So um, doing that sort of thing, change the string builder, you can really make your program a lot faster. 
Okay. Anyway, thanks for coming along. Thanks for watching. Have a great week and I'll see you on Friday and we'll do, do more coding on Friday. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, Byron. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Wayne.